Wednesday, June 12th here on the Just Baseball Show. You got Jack McMullen. I am Peter Apple. And Jack, are you ready to harmonize? We don't have Arm ruining it. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Here's the thing. You and Arm typically do this, but uh, Arm and I, I think, did the last one. And now, eh, no, I think all three of us did the last one. Arm and I did the one before that. And now it's you and I doing this. Three, two, one. Mail bag. Decent switch up there. I went high then low. Could you tell? All right. Welcome to the mailbag. Thank you everybody for asking your questions on our Instagram and on our Twitter. Instagram and Twitter handles are in the episode description. We got eight of them. And I also, not only for just asking them, asking great questions. You even said before we press the record button how excited you were for these eight. I said, great questions. That's all I said, two words. And I would have said that even if they were terrible questions, because it's just a conversation starter. Hey, man, great questions. You ready to go? All right. I'm more excited than Jack (laughs) is because we have a loaded, loaded slate. And it's all brought to you by BetMGM, the king of sports books. All you got to do, download BetMGM on iOS or Android. Then use code just baseball. Why? First bet offer up to $1,500 back in bonus bets. What the hell does that even mean? Well, if you place a bet at standard odds after using our code and it loses, you'll get that wager back in bonus up to $1,500. If it wins, nothing happens. So if you want to get started, use the king of sportsbooks and use code just baseball. But remember, gambling problem, call or text 1-800-GAMBLER. Must be 21 or older and terms and conditions apply. Jack, you want to just get straight into the questions because our first one is an absolute banger, and I'm hoping you'll be a little bit more excited because this is my favorite episode of the week. Is it really? Yeah, I love the mailbags. Love them. Yeah, I like I the mailbags are up there for me. Thing is, like, I'm just never on them, so I'm just like, yeah, you know, it's it's really exciting. Well, let's get to it. All right, let's question it. number one. Build the most underrated starting lineup based on the season so far. This was asked by Calvin underscore Medcalf on Twitter. So I compiled my team. I'm hoping you did the same. We didn't do any starting pitchers, but I got a catcher, a first baseman, a second baseman, third base shortstop, all three outfield spots, and a DH. And I like how we haven't talked to each other yet. So it's our version of underrated. Remember, everyone has their own underrated scale. Yeah. So you want to start with catcher? Yeah. Can we clump the outfielders together? I looked at it as like, I'm grabbing three outfielders. I didn't grab a left field, a center field, and a right field. That's totally fine. I did. So we can can haggle around that. You want to start with catcher? Sure. Let's do that. Um, You want me to go? Go ahead. I know this guy has been in a bit of a of a catching split. He's DH'd a good bit, but he's catching enough for me to consider him a catcher. Ryan Jeffers is my mm-hmm. catcher. I mean, this guy is the war leader for the Minnesota Twins at this point this year, and they're contending for an AL Central. Like, I know they've been streaky, but they're contending in the division because of guys like Ryan Jeffers stepping up. And we're not talking about Ryan Jeffers. I think when you think catcher in the American League this year, you go to an Adley Rutschman, you go to a Sal Perez, you're not talking about a Ryan Jeffers, and his season should be appreciated at this point. I love the Ryan Jeffers pick. I went another direction in the American League, and I went with Connor Wong of the Boston Red Sox. As a catcher, he's hitting 357 in 39 games with a 154 WRC plus 1.6 F4, which is third at the position in in general, and then in general, right, all playing time from Connor Wong, he has a 137 WRC plus, and he's hitting 329. I know that when I turn Red Sox games on these days, and let's say Tyler O'Neill isn't in the lineup because he's been a little bit banged up lately. Let's say Rafael Devers isn't in it either. Connor Wong is their guy. Now, of course, Rob Ref Snyder is hitting like 320 for whatever reason, but against right-handed pitching, Rob Ref Snyder is just not as good as his stats may say. He still had a good season against righties, but he just clips lefties every single second. A guy who hits both sides of the plate is Connor Wong. And when I watch Red Sox games, bringing it all back, he's the guy in the lineup right now that if I'm an opposing pitcher, I might be game planning for. And you might think to yourself, Connor Wong game planning for Peter, stop. Look at the stats. 
154 WRC plus as a catcher, 139 in general, hitting 329. This guy's raking. I think he's the most underrated catcher in baseball right now. But Ryan Jeffers is a great one. I'll start then on first base. And this was a little bit tough because a lot of the good first basemen are already good. And a lot of the bad first basemen are already bad. But I did find one guy that I think a lot of us forgot about. So my most underrated first baseman right now is Jake Cronenworth on the San Diego Padres. 130 WRC plus, 30% better than league average. That's sixth at the position, tied for fifth in F war. We remember Jake Cronenworth last year. Couldn't hit water if he fell off a boat. Thinking to ourselves, is this guy worth the contract at all? Rebound year, been much better for the Padres. Yeah, Crone is my guy. At first base. Like, I think that's the right answer. And you could go to a Josh Naylor, but everybody expected Josh Naylor to build on a good year last year. I think it's... No, (laughs) I expected Isak Paredes to be better. By the way, go check the war numbers. Go check the WRC Plus numers. I feel really good about that. All right, fine. I'll crawl back into my show. No, no, no. Hold on. Hold on. Let's (laughs) stay on this for a minute. I love that you try and win that when, like, you're so clearly getting bludgeoned. In that race. Is bludgeon the right answer? Is bludgeon the right word? I think Isak Paredes is double the war output as Josh Naylor right now. You check on that. I'll take us to second base. But Cronenworth is my guy because the expectations coming off of last year were very low. And he was not overrated, underwhelming last year. And to be this good on a bounce back from your underwhelming go, uh, I think is really impressive. Second base. I go to Bryce Terang in Milwaukee. Terang is the underappreciated second baseman in Major League Baseball at this point. Terang got off to a really rough start in his Major League career last year. We were expecting him to be plug and play. He was not plug and play. He's plug and play this year. And he and Adamas, I think, created the most underrated middle infield tandem in baseball this year. Adamas is not my shortstop pick. Terang is my second base pick. Well, to answer your original question, bludgeoning is the correct term. Yep. 2.1 for Paredes, 0.8 for Naylor. I'm not yep. a great start there. There you go. Nearly triple. And what I will also do is commend you for your second base pick because Bryce Terang is also my second base pick. Dude has 23 stolen bases and he's hitting 300 with a 125 WRC plus. Third at the position, 2.3 F4. That has to be the answer here. He has been awesome for the Milwaukee Brewers and is one of the league leaders in stolen bases. If Ellie De La Cruz didn't steal third every five seconds, Bryce Terang might be leading Major League Baseball in bags. Let's move over to third base. Now, this one, I think, can create a lot of different answers. Um, But one guy that hasn't gotten any love for filling in for Josh Young is Josh H. Smith. Don't forget the H. 134 WRC plus, six at the position, 379 on base percentage, which is second at the position. He's put up a 1.8 F war this season. Josh Young goes down for the Rangers. And now I know the Rangers have not had a good start to the season, right? They're the defending world champs. We expect a lot better, but they've been hampered by injuries, notably to Josh Young. One of the better third basemen in the league was in our top 10. He goes down early. What are the Rangers supposed to do? All right, we'll fill in for with Josh H. Smith, a guy who's played a bunch of different positions. Hopefully, he could just hold it down until Young returns. And that he has, and he has arguably been one of the best third basemen in the American League. When we were doing our all-star ballot, he was right up there in OPS with some of the better third basemen in the league. He has been an incredible stopgap for the Rangers. He has. I go somewhere else in the American League, and I go to a place where we're appreciating a lot of other guys. And we've given this guy his flowers, but I don't think enough for how good he is. I think Jordan Westberg has an all-star case. Yeah. And Westberg is the guy. Like, we don't talk about Jordan Westberg moving forward. Hell, when I was playing the game this offseason of close your eyes and think about the 2027 Baltimore Orioles, Westberg was the bench utility piece. He's so much more than that. I mean, he hits the crap out of the ball. He's playing good defense. He is one of the better war accumulators in the American League. Um, I do think that this guy should be playing in the All-Star game if the season ended today. No, exactly. That's why I didn't put him on my underrated list. And that's why I like the term underrated because it's from the eye of the beholder. Like I personally 
have already put Jordan Westberg up with some of the better third baseman of baseball, but I don't think the general fan has. So I like yeah. that you mentioned him because in my opinion, he's not underrated anymore, but that's just my opinion. I was ready to go with Michael Garcia, but then I saw the WRC plus dip under 90 and I couldn't do it. Yeah, but he is, you know, he's, he's a great fantasy baseball player. He's on my fantasy baseball team and he's up there in points because he's got home runs. He's got steals. He drives and runs. He scores a lot of runs, but overall by WRC plus he's been a below average hitter but for fantasy baseball purposes he could be an underrated guy you don't want your guys walking in fantasy baseball shortstop this one is also tough because we have kind of talked about this guy a lot at least lately but I still don't think the general baseball fan knows truly like what the numbers say and how good he's been compared to other shortstops Ezekiel Tovar of the Colorado Rockies I think has been the most underrated shortstop in baseball 2.2 2.2 F4, seventh at the position. He's top five in average. He's hitting 293, 484 slug, which is again top five in slugging at the position. He's already got 10 home runs, 113 WRC plus. It's always going to be dogged down by Coors Field because, of course, it is park adjusted. But Tovar this season hasn't been a guy who has crazy home road splits or anything. He's playing great defense. He's hitting the ball hard enough and he's spraying the ball into the gaps. And he's the guy that the Rockies gave that free arb deal to. And we all thought to ourselves, all right, good. The Rockies are locking up one of their young quote unquote stars because at the time he had a fine rookie year. He got a lot of playing time. He was a guy that a lot of us were really excited for. And it was one of those things where, all right, he's not dog shit. So good for you, Rockies, for extending him. The Rockies made the right decision here by extending him. So credit to the Rockies and credit to Ezekiel Tovar for not falling into some sophomore slump, but really taking it to another gear. Yes, he is my pick as well. Um, For all the reasons that you just laid out, I think that this guy, like any Rocky is going to be underappreciated, going to be underrated. I think any Marlin is going to be underappreciated, you know, underrated. I think that list is like very small. Tampa recently graduated from that list. I think the Rockies and the Marlins are the two teams that kind of constitute that. Also, anybody good for the Oakland A's too. I'll throw Oakland in there right now, but that used to not be the case with them. Um, The Rockies, it's just kind of perpetually felt that way because you see a good performer and you say, of course, doesn't count. It counts. I like how you didn't include the White Sox. No, because like they're just bad this year. You know what I mean? Like a lot of people appreciated the White Sox, you know, maybe more so than than what they actually were. Like, frankly, Andrew Vaughn has been overrated coming into each of the last two years. You know what I mean? Yeah. The White Sox kind of fall into that. They should be better, but they're so horrible. But there are some decent players yeah. in the White Sox right now. But there's also like no disclaimer. Yeah. Paul DeYoung. Sorry, people. Uh, no, well, let's let's wait for a minute. Left field. So you have three outfielders. I have a left fielder. So I'll give my left fielder first, and then you just do one of your outfielders. Okay. So my most underrated left fielder in baseball this season is Jaron Duran of the Boston Red Sox. As a left fielder, he's slashing 314, 377, 511 for a 145 WRC plus third at the position. Now, when he plays other positions and in totality – He's got a 117 WRC plus. So for whatever reason, when Jaron Duran plays left, he's fantastic. But overall, he still is a very good player. Four home runs, 10 steals this year. He's got a two and a half F war. It's been awesome for the Red Sox. And it's so funny. I I keep finding more underrated Red Sox. But the team still isn't that good yet, which I find interesting because they have so many holes that are just so bad that dog down the rest of these solid players. And I know the Red Sox have finished in last place in a couple of seasons, but the pitching is picking up. Bailey has clearly had a huge influence on this Red Sox team. So you're finding more and more better pitchers. You're finding more and more better fielders. But overall, the Red Sox just haven't had that great of a season, but I don't want to underrate Tanner Houck. Connor Wong, Jaron Duran, some of these guys that will be a part of the Red Sox core moving forward. Yeah. Uh, I also had Duran. Duran was my easiest answer. Like, runaway favorite, best underrated outfielder in baseball right now. The other one is a guy that you actually shouted on yesterday's show, Blake Perkins in Milwaukee. I, I Like, the numbers are not 
great. He's got a 713 OPS. It's a 102 OPS plus. He's got five homers. He's got six stolen bases. So you ask me, what is he doing really well? The answer is defense, which is like what bumps the war. But the reason that I put him in this clumping is because if I said the name Blake Perkins, I think there are some people in baseball media that would say, who? I've never heard that name before. Do you think Mad Dog Chris Russo knows who Blake Perkins is? No chance. Not a chance. I think there are a lot of diehard baseball fans that see B Perkins sitting on the waiver wire in fantasy baseball. And they're just like, I don't know who that is. So that like for what he's doing compared to like who Blake Perkins is as a baseball name, I think he's criminally underrated. 100%. Right field. I don't know. It was tough to find a underrated right fielder. And I wouldn't say that he's having some amazing season, even though he is playing well. But this guy just over the last three years has been underrated. So I wanted to give him a shine. Right now, I think the most underrated right fielder is Anthony Santander of the Baltimore Orioles. Yes. You think Gunner. You think Adley. You think Burns. You think Grayson. You think Bradish. There's so many great players. And then you think about the farm system. But you don't think about that guy who's been standing out there in right field for the Orioles, having 75 home runs over the past three seasons. 33 in 22, 28 and 23, and he's already got 14 this season. 121 WRC plus. If we're talking about when he plays right field, 135 WRC plus. This guy's a power hitter to his core. And Peyton, shout out big league analysis on TikTok and on Instagram, did a breakdown of all the home runs he's hit on balls outside of the zone. Right now, Peyton broke it down. He is the best bad ball hitter in Major League Baseball. So, when Gunner and Adley get on, Anthony Santander has been the guy now for a few years driving them in. Yeah. I think you just went with Santander for the same exact reason that I went with Westberg. Yeah. He's just lower on the totem pole. Lower on the totem pole. That's just how good the Orioles are like shit. 100 so Are they underrated if the Orioles are just so good and we know that? But I feel like people don't think about these players when they think Orioles. Yeah, no, it's like, oh my God. And they have Anthony Santander. Nobody's saying that. It's like, oh, wow, Gunner and Adley are awesome. When in reality, Anthony Santander is a decent defender, is hitting 30 jacks every year. Yeah. Do you have yeah. anybody in or your second outfielder? Uh, so my third, because Jaron Duran and, and Blake yes. Perkins, I was torn between two. And I need you to tell me if this guy qualifies as an outfielder because he's splitting his time between third base and the outfield. For everybody watching on YouTube, I just you almost sneezed. sneezed, and then it just went right back in my body. One of the worst feelings in the history of being a person. We're not cutting this. I was just looking okay. at you like, what's going to happen here? And know. then nothing happened. Nothing Did happened. you mute, or were you just going to like sneeze? I was. Go I muted, and then I unmuted because I wasn't going to sneeze anymore. That's crazy. I hope you sneeze a little bit later in the show, just like so it comes back. Why it's not? Coming. It's coming. Can you tell me if this guy qualifies as an outfielder? Charger. Matt Veerling of the Detroit Tigers. <laughs> Is he a third baseman or an outfielder? Um, so when we go to when we go Time to outfield, speeds. um, I don't see him here on the qualified list. You don't? I don't. So Veerling so far this year has played. 206 innings in the outfield, 208 innings at third base, splitting his time evenly. You can count him. That makes sense. I, I mean, can count him. We just need to talk about Matt Veerling anyway. So just throw him in there. Matt Veerling, aside from a hell of a stretch, is also putting up a really great year. As a 119 OPS plus, he's OPSing 784. Matt Veerling has been one of the things keeping the Detroit Tigers afloat at this point. And I mean, you want to talk about the the struggles of Spencer Torkelson, all you want, Javi Baez being a whole, Colt Keith getting off to a brutal start in his major league career. Matt Veerling and Riley Green have kind of been the two guys. And Green, we knew, was a star going into this year. Veerling was like the fifth piece in the Cody Clemens-Gregory Soto trade. Like, Veerling, man, much like Blake Perkins – I think there are a number of people, and I think fewer people know who Blake Perkins is. I think there are a number of very 
good baseball fans that don't know who Matt Veerling is. I was torn between Veerling and Dalton Varsho. Um, I think, I don't know if Varsho is underrated. I think it's a bounce back from him and it wasn't necessarily an expected bounce back. And he's been, his successes have been overshadowed by Toronto's struggles in the macro. So I sided with Veerling over Varsho. I'm glad you went with Veerling over Varsho. Number one is because maybe it's just whenever I'm turning on a Tigers game, Matt Veerling is not only hitting, but it's a clutch hit. Like it's yeah. when they need the guy to get driven in and Matt Veerling comes to the plate and he, I feel like he always does his job. Now, I don't have numbers to back that up, that he is so clutch. It's just from me turning on Tigers games, consistently seeing him come up in the big moments. Now, for number two, why I prefer Veerling over Varsho in an underrated conversation, I almost feel that when anybody turns on a Blue Jays game and they're watching Vladdy ground out, no, I'm just kidding. Vladdy's obviously been good this year. Bo Bichette be terrible. Bad take by me. We're going to get into some of our bad and best takes so far this season later on in the questions. But I do feel like Varsho is being heralded as one of the Blue Jays' best players right now because of the struggles of some of their stars. So that's why I prefer Veerling in this conversation. Fair. My last outfielder is a Houston Astro. And I think a lot of people thought, including myself, that Chaz McCormick was going to kind of take that next step, right? We saw him in the playoffs last year. We saw him just in general in the regular season look like one of the better left fielders in baseball. Now that hasn't exactly materialized into a great season this year, but another guy who they keep playing and keeps playing well is Jake Myers. Six bombs, six steals, a 122 WRC plus and a 1.7 F war. All of those numbers are among the peak of center fielders in major league baseball. Now, again, when you think of the Astros, Jake Myers might be the last guy you think of, right? Yeah. Go around the diamond. I'm sure Astros fans, like they're thinking about Mauricio Dubon or they're thinking about Jeremy Pena, even if they're not thinking about the four horsemen at the top of the lineup. But Jake Myers, I think, has been baseball's arguably most underrated outfielder in general for the type of production he's putting up in center field while being a good defender. Especially given the situation that he finds himself in where the Astros are like very much underwhelming. The fact that he has taken that next step when, like, I, again, the entire Astros conversation is negative. We don't even get to the positive like we do with the show. I think Myers is a more drastic example of Varsho where we talk more about the Astros struggles and less about the Blue Jays struggles and more about Varsho being one of the few bright spots and less about Myers being one of the few bright spots. Yeah. All right. So that's our underrated team. No, I've got a DH. I don't know if you have a DH DH, as do I, I forgot about the DH. Crazy. My bad. I'm going to give a white sock love. Wow. Gavin Sheets. Hmm. Dude has a 123 WRC plus. He's like, he and <clears throat> Paul DeYoung are the two net positive players that have played the overwhelming majority of the year. I think that's a better example than mine. But I just wanted to give him more shine because he just does this every year. Rooker? <laughs> Josh <laughs> so Peterson. Too. Yeah. 150 WRC plus? Yeah. 50% better than the league average hitter with seven home runs? On a Diamondbacks team that I think everybody's kind of left for dead at this point? I haven't. But I think the greater baseball media landscape has thought of the Diamondbacks as that one cool story who made the World Series and are now under 500. Everybody knows about Cattell Marte. Everybody knows about Corbin Carroll's struggles. Everybody knows that Christian Walker is just a very good first baseman. But are you looking at the third hitter in the lineup, Jock Peterson? Now, I know he's only facing righties. But damn it, when he faces righties... He's one of the better hitters in baseball. A 150 WRC plus is absurd. Yeah. So I think that's fair. I think Gavin Sheets, though, is a better answer because I think people know that Jock Peterson is good. I just don't think people know that he's been this good. Yeah. So we'll go with the Gavin Sheets. I think that's a better answer. So that's the underrated team. My lineup Connor Wong at catcher, Jake Cronenworth at first, Bryce Terang at second, Josh Smith at third, Josh H. Smith, Ezekiel Tovar at short. Jaron Duran, Anthony Santander, and Jake Myers in my outfield. And my DH is Jock Peterson. So, uh, Josh Smith, the other Josh Smith, is the former Atlanta Hawks four that participated in several 
dunk contest. Is that right? Is that, that why is we correct. go by Josh yes. A. Smith? Josh Smith on the Hawks. I remember he like dunked from almost the three point line and everybody freaked out or not yeah. the three point line, the free throw line, the free throw line, Josh Smith and Amari Stoudemire. Those were the two like big man dunk contest guys before Dwight Howard got into it. Um, my team, Ryan Jeffers is the catcher. Cronenworth at first, Terang at second, Jordan Westberg at third, Tovar at short, an outfield of Duran, Matt Veerling, Blake Perkins, and Gavin Sheets is the DH. Amazing. Let's move on to our second question. And this one we're going to put on our history hats. I don't know if a history hat is a thing, but you'll understand when I ask the question. When they retire, will Justin Verlander and or Clayton Kershaw be top 10 pitchers of all time? That was asked by Jackson Job one on Twitter. I don't think it's the real Jackson Job. It's not him. Yeah. But a Jackson Job truther. And we respect Jackson Job truthers over here. So Clayton Kershaw has a 157 ERA plus. It's the fourth highest behind Bill Foster, 164, Bullet Rogan at 161, both Negro League pitchers, and Mariano freaking Rivera at 205. Blows away the competition. And he's 28th in war among all pitchers all time Verlander 131 ERA plus tied for 43rd in major league history 25th in war so what is ERA plus well here's the definition from MLB.com it takes a player's ERA and normalizes it across the entire league it accounts for external factors like ballparks and opponents and then adjusts so a score of 100 is league average 150 is 50% above league average and what it does is it measures across eras no stat is perfect, but it's very similar to a stat like WRC plus park adjusted accounts for the time period that this player played in. So I don't really love to look at like how many Cy Youngs do you have? Because at the end of the day, we know that the awards voters, they normally don't get it right. At least years ago. Now it's getting better and better when we have more data to prove that this guy won the award, but overall, it's not that good. So if you're saying, well, this guy has a bunch of Cy Youngs, like great. He's probably already in the top 10 pitchers of all time. So I have a rough draft. I have a rough draft of a top 10 pitchers list of all time. And you tell me if you think that they slot in there. And for all those people, I'm sure this is going to get clipped for TikTok. I need the younger people to not just say, oh, he's playing against plumbers. Because then, in reality, our list is only going to be from the 21st century. We have to appreciate the guys who did it in an era where they can't control their competition, but they put up sparkling numbers. So here's a rough draft. Pedro Martinez, Walter Johnson, Christy Mathewson, Roger Clemens, Randy Johnson, Sandy Koufax, Greg Maddox, Cy Young, Satchel Paige, Steve Carlton, and then you have guys like Kid Nichols and Grover Alexander who threw over 5,000 innings back in the 20s, and they all have a higher ERA plus than Justin Verlander. I just threw a lot of, at you. We could break it down. I just wanted to get it all out there. Do you view Verlander or Kershaw as top 10 or all time? When you hear those names, when you hear where they rank in war and ERA plus, I'm curious your thoughts. Well, I mean, some of those guys were playing against plumbers. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you bet. Um, I think this is how I kind of view it. Verlander is already at 3,000 plus innings. He's shooting to get to 300 wins. He's one of 20 with 3,000 strikeouts. Kershaw, I think, is going to go until he becomes the 20th guy to get to 3,000 strikeouts in his career. I think the 3,000 strikeout threshold is very important. Very it's hard for me to go pre-modern era with some of these guys. And, you know, like the people that I've never talked to that saw them pitch live, like how can I view Walter Johnson as a top 10 pitcher when I talked to my 88 year old grandfather and he never watched Walter Johnson pitch? You know what I mean? Like there, there's nothing anecdotal to help me out. Um, when I think the pantheon of pitching, I think Randy Johnson, Roger Clemens, I think, Greg Maddox, I think Sandy Koufax, I think Nolan Ryan. Um, do you think Pedro? I, I think do think Pedro, Pedro, yeah. Pedro's I, my GOAT. I think for what he did during the steroid era, I, I, I he's my GOAT. 
So Randy Johnson is my goat. Um, but Pedro is up there too. That was just a gaff to leave Pedro. Out. I view Steve Carlton. I view Tom Seaver yep. in that as well. Um, th- there are other guys. I do think that Clayton Kershaw goes in there. I think he and Sandy Koufax are two of the greatest, if not the two greatest left-handed pitchers of all time. Koufax's career was shorter than everybody wanted it to be, from my understanding. Kershaw's career is not as long as a lot of other people want it to be. Like, you got to remember, Verlander's, what, five years older than Clayton Kershaw at this point? Kershaw's not 40. Kershaw's 36. But we're nearing the end, and yet whenever Kershaw is on the hill, he's rocking like a mid-2 ZRA. Clayton Kershaw could very well retire without having a bad year. And if I'm not mistaken, his career ERA sits at 248. If he gets to 3,000 strikeouts and he's got a career ERA under two and a half, he's a top 10 pitcher of all time. For me, um, Verlander, I, I think it's tough. And I know that there has been, you know, three different iterations of Justin Verlander. And I love Justin Verlander. He was when he was a young tiger man, like that's one of the first pitchers that I fell in love with. But is he all right? Like he, he, he's dominant for stretches at a time, but I don't view Justin Verlander as overwhelmingly dominant for the entirety of his career. And that is really how I need to view a lot of these pitchers. Like Randy Johnson threw a perfect game and he was 41. Damn. Uh, Kershaw is going to be, overwhelmingly dominant for the entirety of his career. So that's why I say yes, Kershaw, no Verlander. Yeah, I think Kershaw is a top 10 pitcher of all time already, and I don't think that Verlander will be able to crack that top 10. There's just too many good pitchers, and I'm an appreciator of the Plummer era, you know, before modern era. So I'm always going to give the leg up to a guy in Walter Johnson who has like 130 career war. Yeah, I'm out because I just I have no idea how to contextualize it. That's totally fine. I still do. Now, you can disagree with that. That's totally fine. I'm not going to hold it against anybody. I just love old baseball, and I want to give those guys their flowers just because they played a long time ago. But the numbers are the numbers, and Walter Johnson literally like threw a million innings at like a 2-7 and was throwing whatever miles an hour. But it definitely freaked out everybody because every single time he'd throw a press clipping would come out about how he beat some motorcyclist at a straight up velo competition. That might have been Bob Feller. I don't know, but I'm entertained by it. So I'm going to continue to applaud Walter Johnson, Christy Mathewson, Kid Nichols, Lefty Grove, Grover Alexander, all these guys. I think it's cool. But Kershaw, regardless of time period, is in there. Fourth best ERA plus is absurd. You know who's fifth? DeGrom. I know he is. Another guy who doesn't get put in the conversation with Kershaw Verlander, even though he definitely should. Max Scherzer has a career ERA that is lower than Verlander, a better ERA plus. He has a 75 career B-War. Verlander's at 82. This is really not that far off from each other. And Verlander has just pitched a lot longer than Scherzer has. But if Scherzer was healthy right now, he could be as effective as Justin Verlander easily. And we want to give yeah. we want to give the Nats shit for the Pat Corbin contract and the Steven Strasburg contract. The Verlander that, con- or, yeah, go ahead. That Max Scherzer contract might be the best contract since 2000. Like that was amazing. Amazing work. I think they Bryce Harper's better. contract is going to go up there too, but like Harper and Scherzer are I think the two pristine examples of a huge money deal working out. I couldn't agree with you more. And just to wrap up on the Kershaw point, I think after Kershaw's career, we're going to be talking about him as the greatest regular season pitcher ever. Yeah. Straight up ever. Probably. Because think about it. By ERA plus, it's Mariano Rivera, who's a reliever, two Negro League players, then Kershaw. Yeah. Unbelievable. All right, let's move on to question number three, and we're we're staying on that wavelength. If I told you three players who have debuted in the past year, since June of 2023, are Hall of Famers, who would you predict and why? Asked by CJ underscore Harris underscore nine on Twitter. Now, this is tough. Yeah, this isn't setting us up for failure or anything. At all. But let's answer it. I'll play the game. I'll play the game. I got two answers. 
I'm he not, asked for three. I know, but I only have two. No, no, no. Can We're we gonna find a third. Three? All right, we'll combine for three. I don't know why, but haven't you noticed that the sentiment around Yoshinobu Yamamoto has been weirdly negative? I feel like people are just waiting for him to blow up because he gets the biggest contract ever for a pitcher with the Los Angeles Dodgers without throwing a pitcher in Major League Baseball, really struggles in Korea, and I think it might be Dodger hate. It might just be big market hate, but everybody wanted to crush this guy. And now I'm not going to be the guy to say, well, here's his stats besides Korea. How about with Korea? Dude striking out nearly 30% of batters, 5% walk rate, 3 ERA, has been absolutely dominant, and as soon as he's been getting going, 0 6 9 ERA in June over his last two starts, was better in May, dominated the Yankees in Yankee Stadium, and just keeps getting better and better. Three-time Ijisawa Moro winner in the MPB, comes over as a young phenom, and has been fantastic so far. He's only 24 years old. I think he's going to build a Hall of Fame career. That's one who I actually think will end up being a Hall of Famer. Now, the next ones are just guys, I only have one more, who's just such a thoroughbred talent and has debuted recently that I think has a shot. But I actually do think that Yamamoto is going to be a Hall of Famer. I, I genuinely do. I think he's going to put up a 2-8 ERA in 180 innings for the next 15 years. He's got too much working for him. He's got like six pitches. He's a freak athlete. I think he's just going to keep doing it forever. I think this is a home run contract by the Dodgers. I'm saying it right now in June, two months into his contract. I'm willing to yeah, say Yeah, we're 13 starts good. in. They're hoping he's that several good. hundred. I'm willing to eat cake on this one. I don't think, a, well, if he doesn't make the Hall of Fame, do I eat cake? Maybe. Is eat cake a thing? Isn't that what uh, Marie Antoinette said or something? Let them, Let eat, them cake. eat cake. Is that was that Marie Antoinette? That yes, it was so. somebody else. I thought it was just eat shit. Like I'll I'll eat shit. <laughs> All right, fine. I'll eat shit if Yamamoto is an. Yeah, all. there we go. Um, Yamamoto was the guy that I settled on as my third. Actually, there wow. were two others. Your second, I think I know where you're going. Paul Skeens. Yeah, I got to stop glazing though, so I have to I have to put myself on mute. I'm gonna go grab a Celsius while you do this. <laughs> okay. No, all I'm saying is, folks. Finally, Jack's off the camera. We can talk about real takes. We know what Paul Skeens looks like. We know what Paul Skeens looks like. We see 100. We see the slider, the breaker. We see the splinker at 94 miles an hour. We know that he's the best pitching prospect since St Steven Strasburg. Now, is Steven Strasburg a Hall of Famer? No. But he's a World Series MVP. At the peak of his powers, was he one of the best pitchers in Major League Baseball? Yes. Can he be better than Steven Strasburg? Can he be that Hall of Fame level pitcher? He has the talent to do so. But I think it's fair not calling him an ace yet. That's all I'm saying. How's your Celsius? Welcome back. That's crisp. It's cool, refreshing. Are you done glazing? Because I, I have to move on. Yeah, go ahead. Move on. Uh, so you named two of the three that I had. The other was Ellie De La Cruz. And Ellie, it's tough because he's striking out a shit ton. Like 162 games, this guy's punched out 230 times. But we love accumulation. <laughs> we are huge fans of accumulation. And this guy not only is as exciting a defender as we've got in baseball, he's as exciting a player as we've got in baseball. And is there not a chance that he's like putting up Lou Brock, Ricky Henderson numbers when it comes to stolen bases? Yeah, I mean, that's not out of the realm of possibility. I just think that he's so... I just think there's so much to work on with him. Like, you call him a really exciting defender, and in terms of watching, you're so right, because he's so fast, and he's just got a freaking missile of an arm. So whenever you see him just throw it to first base, you get a little titillated there. At least I do. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm not speaking for everybody else. I'm just speaking for myself. But do I really think he's going to put together a Hall of Fame career? Like, no, I don't. I don't. But he's, for the sake young, of the question. Yeah, for the sake of the question. We have to. He's a young 22 years old. Yeah. Reminder, he's a young 22. That's nuts to me. It's 
four years younger than me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that's a that's a fine third answer. I'll take that because it could be a wow when we're done in 20 years and we're looking back at Ellie De La Cruz's career. Remember that four year stretch he stole 80 bags a year? Something and like that. And hit 30 homers a year, 30, too. He exactly. went 30, 80, four years in a row. And he's going to be a fan favorite if he's doing that for a long time. So, you know, the aura, the aura is going to seep through those Hall of Fame voters. And people are going to ignore the punch outs and they're going to ignore the airs. Oh, they're going to ignore that for sure. So I could see it. Yeah, see I'm it. telling you. Answer. Um, the other name that jumped out to me who debuted on May 12th of last year. So he doesn't count because they asked for pre June or post June of last year. Yuri Perez. Wow. He's a cheat code. It's a lot like skeins. We're like stuff in a vacuum. It's like, oh, how does anyone touch this? And he's so young. So young. Mm. It's a good one. Yeah, that's what I got. So I, I don't love answering questions like this because yeah. you're just putting unfair value on people, but it's a really good question. And like, I thought it was a decent thought exercise. And just to applaud the Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame level talent that these guys had. Yeah. Now, what makes a Hall of Famer is doing it year and year and year and year in and out, right? Yeah. Instead of and, just... And we've seen, what, what six starts from Skeens? Yeah. <laughs> Five? It's just impossible to actually call any of these guys Hall of Famers, but I, I've i seen enough from Yamamoto. <laughs> I've seen enough from Skeens. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, next question. Who are the most disappointing players so far this season compared to your expectations? Asked by Dylan Winnick 32 on Twitter. I got two answers. Both are hitters. Do you have a pitcher? Uh, yeah, I've got three. I just, I started throwing names at the wall. It's like, who's burned me? No, that's totally fair. Give me your first one. Well, Hunter Brown. Right. But like, we have that conversation all the time. Brian Bayo. And I had my concerns about Bayo, but he's got an ERA flirting with five. The other one is largely health related and we know it. Tristan McKenzie, like this year for Tristan McKenzie has just really upset me. Mm. And I, I know that he's dealing with an elbow issue, but like it just, it, how is he the runt of that rotation? Yeah. How has Ben Lively got a mid twos and, and McKenzie's sporting a five and he's walking five and a half per nine? I think it's an elbow thing. That's why I it is. It is like it is a documented, like on the athletic elbow thing. Yeah. So here are my guys. We've talked about Spencer Torkelson at length, but negative 0.7 F4, that's the third lowest among all qualified hitters. I thought he was going to hit 40 home runs this year. Very disappointed with Spencer Torkelson, but hopefully he comes back and he's totally fine. But staring down the barrel of four homers and a 71 WRC plus for a guy that I was trying to force into the top 10 first baseman, yeah, not my best. Um, another guy, I mean, I'm a huge fan of his, and he's been just downright shitty. Randy Rosarina. Mm -hmm. He's hitting 175, 284 OBP, 320 slug. I know he's got eight home runs and seven st stolen bases, but negative 0.2 F4. Yeah. This is a raised team where I bet them over wins, division, playoffs. How are they supposed to compete for any of those when they're arguably not their best player, but their most marketable player? is worth negative value so far this season. Randy, the guy in the WBC, the guy crossing his arms, the guy who is the Messiah when the lights are bright, the guy that even during the regular season over the past couple of years is a 2020 lock. Yeah. And now he's probably going to do that again, but damn it, negative 0.2 F4 is, is unbelievably bad for a guy who I thought was one of the better outfielders in baseball. Yeah. So those are right my here? most disappointed players. And we got another question. This one is I've about... actually got another hitter. Oh, go ahead before we move on. Austin Riley is upsetting me. And I know he's been hurt. Like, trust me. I know that. I know that. I know that. But at the end of the day, like, I thought Austin Riley at 50% of what he is was better than 86 WRC plus 50 games in. 86, man. Like, I still believe he's the best third baseman in baseball. 
but it's been a bad two months. And I, again, I know it's injury related, but man, like it, it really hurts to look at Austin Ryan. And it's like, Oh, you have the 15th best war among third basemen in major league baseball. <sighs> Shouldn't be a thing. Even if he's hurt. I thought you could take away an arm and a leg from Austin Riley and he was going to be top five among third baseman of war. I'm glad you brought that up too, because yes, we could say, oh, well, he's been injured. But I think even Braves fans, any baseball fan would say, okay, an injured Austin Riley would give him a break. How about a 105 WRC plus one time? Not 86. Not in the not depths 86. of third baseman. Not I hitting think. 230 and slugging under 350. Like that, that ain't Austin Riley. That can't happen. Can't happen. So, I, yeah, I needed to shout it out. So we got some more questions here on this episode. But before that, a quick break. All right. Back to the mailbag. And this has to do with Jack and me. Let's find some of our bad preseason takes and good ones. So the question is, which one of your preseason takes were horrible? And which did you get spot on to this point? Asked by Alex underscore Cornell 26 on Instagram. What do you think has been your best take of the season so far? I don't know. Frankly, <laughs> like I, I have no idea. I feel like I whiff a lot. I also don't vividly like make takes, like make strong takes often. I do. Yeah. I know you do. I don't that often. And the ones that I really remember are the ones that go wrong. So I'll start with the one I got wrong. If you can remember any W's that I have, that's great. I do. I know the W. That that you have or that, that I have? you have. Oh, what's the W that I have? You gave out Jared Jones plus 66 fucking 100 for rookie <laughs> of the year. <laughs> like that absurd line for a guy. Like you do glaze him. Yeah, you do. for sure. And for sure. it might not be an ace yet. Can we go back to the Skeens Hall of Fame conversation? <laughs> exactly. But I made fun of you for glazing these two guys, and now I'm calling Paul Skeets a Hall of Famer and your best take, Jared Jones. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I understand the glazing, but I'm still going to make fun of you. But, I mean, holy shit. He's one of the best pitchers, young pitchers in the National League right now. All right, that's Came a out Rookie of the year, like, with guys who, had, who haven't even debuted yet, who have no shot, maybe never will debut. Those were plus 6,600 at the beginning of the season were what those odds represented. I think that's your best take. Now, he's not... I don't think he's going to win rookie of the year. No. But he's in the race. And at plus yeah. 6600, that's an absurdly great take. That that that's a W. The L that I remember, I remember vividly saying this and I was like, we have a quote card. So I am going to go back and find the quote card and I found the quote card. If Chris Sale throws 120 good innings for them, he could take the Braves to a level that we haven't seen. Sale's been awesome. But, like, the Braves are super shitty right now by standards. So, like, that was the L that I found. I was just like, oh, yeah, no. I was very adamant that the Braves were the best team in baseball. On paper, they were the best team in baseball. Braves versus Dodgers. I was always team Braves. Braves versus Yankees with Soto. I was always team Braves. And now they look like, you know, a wild card contender. <laughs> it's kind of it. Crazy, right? So, my best take. This is my Mona Lisa. I made a 20-minute YouTube video breaking down why you should take the Miami Marlins under 78 and a half. I thought it was an hour. It might have been an hour. I think it was an very hour. Long. I'm gonna I'm gonna go find the length, but you finish your thought. Not an hour, but it was a very long. I went through every single player on the roster, and it was the biggest bet I have ever made in my entire life. And I think it's gonna hit. So I think that's my best take of the season. My worst take of the season. There are plenty to choose from. Could it be Bo Bichette being ranked over Marcus Semyon? Considering Marcus Semyon is legitimately graded as the best fielder in baseball right now and is still playing well while Bo Bichette has arguably gotten worse defensively and he sucks at hitting now. That's a bad one. But when I talk about takes, I'm talking about I'm putting my money where my mouth is. Like, I don't think people are going to kill me for Bo Bichette having a tough start to the year. Bo Bichette was easily one of the better shortstops in baseball. He's having a tough start. That's a bad take, but I don't think it's my worst. My worst is what I put actual money on that's going legitimately horribly. I bet Corbin Carroll to win MVP. Yeah. And Corbin Carroll 
has a 0.2 F4, two home runs, and a 71 WRC+. plus. I bet on him to win the MVP. One of my favorite player award bets. If you look at where I allocated my units, more of them were on Corbin Carroll than most of my player awards. And he's been a bottom 20 player in the league. And I bet on him to win MVP. So if we're talking about where I actually put my money where my mouth is, the Miami Marlins is probably the greatest bet I've ever made. And I just donated half a unit on uh, Corbin Carroll MVP because he hasn't even been close. Can I get your final guess on runtime for that Marlins video? Uh, I think it was 27 minutes. Wow, 27.50. Bang. Knew it. It wasn't that long. <laughs> See, for one bet, that's pretty long. I had to go through it because I, I knew a lot of people were going to tail it. Yeah. And I had to break it down in such a lengthy way. This is the biggest bet of my what, life. Here. What you're saying is you know your influence is absolutely massive. Not what I'm saying. Fungus influence. I'm saying if one person tails the biggest bet of my life, I want them to know that even if it loses, you got every ounce of research humanly possible to do it. You're saying if you jumped off a cliff, there would be a lot of people landing at the bottom of that cliff with you. Would you come with me? No shot, bro. What do you mean? No I shot. You told me to. <laughs> this is the one way street, man. No, you know why I know that? Because if you were going to jump off a cliff, I know it's going to be cushy at the bottom. Yeah, a hundred percent. Smart guy. That's totally I who I am. Look, see, for me, you'd be like, I have no idea what's at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's probably there might actually be nails at the bottom of this. Like it might be worse than just the ground. <laughs> just worse than just the cliffs. Yeah, it's worse. Brutal. All right. Or uh, do you have any other just off the top of your head tough ones? Great. One I don't think so. Back. I'm still hung up on uh, when did the Twins finish in last place? I'm still hung up on me saying the Twins were going to win the World Series when they literally finished in last. Yeah, that was a is that 21. One. Yeah, that. Might and then be. I said they were a last place team when they won the division in 22. <laughs> like I was just wrong both times. Year on the Twins. Um, I mean, I've had some. Tr- I mean, I, I, I still like. Yeah, I mean, it was a horrific take. I brought up that the Reds should consider trading Ellie De La Cruz. That was, that one, was that's, insane. That's real tough. That's take the mic. Not often away. do I call something dumb like in real time. Usually, I'm way more respectful than that. But that I was like, no, that's dumb. Yeah, that was. I was trying to be fun, but that was just horrific. Understood. Um, so, well, we are who we are. All right, next question: Which rookies are not getting enough praise? specifically for being overshadowed by elite top rookies this season asked by R Garretson 24 on Instagram. I think this is a great question. I have one for each league and an honorable mention. Do you want me to go first or do you want to? Wow. You have one for each league. You go first. So in the national league, I think this guy has been the most underrated rookie of all rookies. Joey Ortiz of the Milwaukee Brewers is a freaking beast. Slashing 285, 378, 465. Dude has a 141 WRC plus. That's amongst the top third basemen in the league. Walking almost as much as he's striking out. 2.1 F4. I'm telling you, go watch a Brewers game. This guy is just a grinder. Ball player at its core. Like even his face, when he's sitting on first base, looks like a gnarled baseball player that you'd take a picture from like the 1930s and it would be his picture on baseball reference. Like he's just a grinder. He's good in all aspects of the game. He's a good defender, good base runner, just plays the game at such a high level on all sides of the ball. Such a good baseball player. Joey Ortiz, if we remember, was in the Corbin Burns deal with DL Hall to the Brewers And people said, did the Brewers get enough? They certainly did, even if D.L. Hall never becomes anything, because I think Joey Ortiz is going to be their third baseman for the foreseeable future and can play other positions if they need him. Wow. A.L., who do you got? In the American League, in terms of underrated rookies, there's not a lot to look at, but I got to give Willie Abreu his shine. Mm-hmm. Slashing 272, 344, 485 for a 129 WRC plus six homers, seven steals. That's awesome. But on top of it, very similar to Ortiz, been playing such great defense in multiple different spots in the outfield. Remember what we're talking about with Jaron Duran playing left, sometimes playing center? That whole outfield is being rearranged every other second. Willie Abreu, 
really sound baseball player for the Red Sox? So I've got one in the National League, one in the American League. National League hitter, American League pitcher. National League hitter is Mason Wynn. Hmm. Cardinals are, you know, two through five in the NL Centrals is very clumpy right now. It's the Brewers, and then it's everybody else by, I think, a game and a half at this point. And Mason Wynn, lost in the disappointment of the St. Louis Cardinals, is hitting 306. He's third among qualified rookies in OPS behind Joey Ortiz and Willie Abreu, the two that you named. He is awesome. And like you mentioned the defensive abilities and like the guy that you want to see, you know, maybe in the all-star game, just for what he's going to do defensively, put on an absolute show. He is amazing. Um, And it took a year. Like it, I was so impressed by him last year in AAA. He got up, was very overmatched for the last month of the season in AAA or in the big leagues. And then this year, it's just been a different story. And Mason Wynn looks comfortable. Mason Wynn looks like a franchise cornerstone for the St. Louis Cardinals moving forward. And while Jordan Walker struggled out of the gates, Mason Wynn flourished. Mason Wynn is one of the most fun players to watch play shortstop. I don't think there's a more fun player to watch play shortstop than Francisco Lindor. I He's just... He's the best defender I've watched in the infield since Andrelton Simmons. Wow. But if we're talking about Nolan Arenado is up there too. Yeah. I've just, I feel like I've never seen Lindor make a bad play in my entire life watching him. My entire life. Um, When he's with the Guardians or Indians, whenever that was. And then now with the Mets, he's just, I think he's the perfect defender. Nolan Arenado is up there too. And I'm not saying that Mason Wynn and like guys like Ellie De La Cruz are in that bucket of just the elite of the elite defenders. Pure watching aura, like Mason Wynn and Ellie De La Cruz, watching them play shortstop is so much fun. It's really fun. I got burned. I'll I'll tweet I'll tweet it out uh, at some point. But I got burned when he was in Indy last year. He got a chopper, like kind of deep in the hole. And it looked like he was gearing up to throw it 105 miles an hour. So I like, I totally sold it. I was like, here we go. Like I was ramped up, ready to go for 105. And he just lost it over there. for a <laughs> Like, <laughs> like I got burned. I'll, I'll find it. I'll text it to you. And you let me know if it's Twitter worthy or not. But um, my American League guy is an arm that I was not convinced of whatsoever. And I know that he had a good year in 22. I saw him throw in 22 in AAA. And I was like, this guy's got it for sure. In 23, I see him and I'm like, this guy lost it for sure. And in 24, I'm watching a couple of AAA starts. I'm like, this guy still lost it for sure. And now he's got a 2.84 ERA in the big leagues in 50 and two thirds innings. I think I know who you're talking about. Simeon Woods Richardson of the Minnesota Twins. This guy was north south. He was fastball at the top of the zone that was 91 92. That changeup that everybody loved talking about and a curveball. Simeon Woods Richardson, by Arsenal breakdown, is throwing about 30% slider right now. That was a pitch that, like, more so, like, did not exist for him a couple of years ago. He was throwing it 10% of the time, 15% of the time. And it just wasn't that great. It was something to deviate from the north south. And now, by run value, it is the fifth best slider in Major League Baseball this year. How does that happen? He's <laughs> such a young guy. Like, again, he's 23 years old. Feels like he's been around forever because he's been part of two major trades. He was drafted by New York in 18 out of high school. And he went from New York to Toronto in the Marcus Stroman deal. And then went from Toronto to Minnesota in the Jose Barrios deal. So he was one of the young headliners for two legitimate mid or frontline starting pitchers. So you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting. And I was like, I think I'm done. I think I have to like take all my stock away from Simeon Woods Richardson. And then the slider turns into one of the best pitches in baseball. Like slider leaderboards in terms of run value. Tanner Houks has a run value of 15, which is crazy. Zach Littell has a run value of 10. That's second. Tells you that Tanner Houks slider is like that much better than everybody else. And then John Gray, Chris Sale, Simeon Woods Richardson, 
and then you get to Jared Jones, Logan Gilbert, Tanner Bybee. He's in that conversation for a pitch that he was throwing 10% of the time last year. Like I, I didn't see the East-West element coming, but here we are with Simeon Woods Richardson. Does Simeon Woods Richardson remind you of anybody? Because I have a name in mind. And it's not about what they look like on the mound. But it's 91 to 92 at the top of the breaker and a, and a third pitch. And he's just dicing through people. Who does that remind you of? Where I still, to this day, don't even understand how he's been so good. I know he struggled this season so far. We already talked about him. Doesn't that remind you of somebody? Who? Tristan McKenzie. It's just tough because Simeon is like such a... He's not he's not stocky, but he's like a thick cut guy. That's why I'm saying don't think about what they look like. Yeah. I'm just talking about 91 at the top of the breaker and the third pitch. But the thing just, is, he was sitting, he was sitting 90, 91 last year. He's sitting 93 this year. I mean, McKenzie's like 92, 93 when he's right. I just I s- didn't see the slider coming out of yeah. any. That's a big thing for me. No, I remember like, you know, you arm and I have our group chats and stuff. And like, you guys were talking about him. And then like, this always happens with a lot of young players. It's like arm and Jack will start talking about him. And then I'll look into him because they know before I do. And then I looked into him and I was like, oh yeah, they're right. This guy's just not that good. I mean, you don't even have to look at the numbers. Like just watch him pitch. It's like a righty throwing 90 with like an okay breaking ball. It's like, of course he's not going to work. Look at him now. I love that about baseball. That's why it's yeah. the best and worst sport because a guy like Simeon Woods Richardson, like we, we left him for dead. This is and what makes it is. the best. Yeah. I think it's awesome. So do you have any other answers to this question? Oh, I have an honorable mention. Okay. Wenzel Perez is having a pretty damn good year for the Tigers. Yeah, he is. 107 WRC plus three home runs, four steals. I know slashing 252, 316, 413. I just wanted to bring him up because the Tigers have had some tough luck, right? Talking about Spencer Torkelson. How about a guy like Parker Meadows? Yeah. I threw a little change on him to win Rookie of the Year. I mean, I would call that a bad take because it was a long shot, but he's not even in Major League Baseball. Yeah. So the he's fact that Tork is the guy, Riley Green's been great, but even a guy like Parker Meadows doesn't take any sort of next step, not even a f- real first step, but not even a next but Wenzel Perez has been that guy. So I just wanted to bring him up. He's not in that same boat as a Joey Ortiz or, you know, Willie Abreu, but he's worthy of discussing. Yeah, I think so. I, he's been a spark plug for them, and I love it. So we got a couple more questions left. One is specifically for Jack, and one is specifically for me. We'll start with the one specifically for you, Jack. What percent of challenges through ABS – are successful asked by l underscore woo underscore 23 on twitter for anybody who doesn't really know what the abs system is a lot of people who've been listening to this podcast probably do but we get new people listening all the time yeah can you break down the abs system and how many of those challenges that the players do are successful from your time watching minor league baseball in the booth for the indianapolis indians the triple a affiliate for the pirates yeah that makes it's a really good question, and me explaining ABS will elevate a really boring answer because okay. the really boring answer, I think, is 50%, <laughs> which is like you wish it was 80% they lost and the umpires are always right. I'd say it's around 50%. Um, ABS is the automated ball strike system. So ABS system is not repetitive like RIP in peace, rest in peace in peace. It's automatic ball strike system. So it's ABS. Um ABS is the computerized strike zone that adjusts to hitter height. So Baseball America had a pretty good article going into this year about the complaints that ABS had last year and how it was way too advantageous to the hitters because the zone was not tall enough to account for the, for the high strikes for the high fastball. And that's how pitchers make money. Now the high fastball, right? They get whiffs, they get swings and misses underneath the high fastball. So they elevated the top of the ABS zone and it's based on a percentage of hitter height. I think it was at like 52% last year and it's at like 53.5% this year, something like that. Um, 
it sets the perimeter of the strike zone. If a millimeter of the baseball clips the perimeter of the strike zone, then it is ruled a strike. Tuesday through Thursday in AAA, you have the full ABS system. So the home plate umpire wears an earpiece, a Siri-type voice within half a second of the ball popping the catcher's mitt is going to say ball or strike, and they're going to call that. So it is an entirely computerized zone. And those are the games that suck <laughs> because we had a 15-run game, a position player came in and was lobbing in 50. And ABS was saying that it crossed the front of the plate a millimeter upstairs. And in a 15-run game, home plate umpire can't call that a strike because the ABS system called it a ball. There's no malleability to that strike zone. The challenge system is something that I do think will eventually make its way to Major League Baseball. And I really like it. Each team is given three challenges over the course of a game, Friday through Sunday. And if you lose, then you lose one of those three. It's pretty much like a coach's challenge and you lose a timeout, like that kind of thing. So if you win, you keep it. If you lose, you lose it. I really haven't seen many teams lose all three challenges over the course of a given game. But they can simply touch the top of their helmet or their catcher's mask or their hat if the pitcher is challenging to you know, challenge and go up to the big board and look at it a lot like a tennis serve. Um, I think it's a flawed zone. I, It's weird to call it inconsistent. I don't think it's inconsistent. I just think it pinches you horizontally a little bit more. Like there's really no give to anything. There's no zone adjustment. If Greg Maddox was throwing in triple A right now, he'd be walking five per nine. We'd be like, this guy is nothing <laughs> because He's, he's not getting the black. Like the black does not exist in AAA right now. And it sucks. And that's why you see the elevated walk numbers. That's why you should take hitter numbers and pitcher numbers with a grain of salt in AAA right now. Having said that, in terms of challenge success rate, more or less 50%, I think there are some games where, you know... Uh, the win rate on challenges is around 75, 80%. And that doesn't tell you that the hitters or the pitchers are on it. It tells you that the umpire is bad. Mm. And there are some games where teams lose their challenges quickly. They lose two in the first four innings and they're gone. And that tells you that the umpire is good. Mm. I think that you'll see the win rate of challenges against Pat Hoberg be very, very low. And you'll see the win rate of challenges against an Angel Hernandez type or a Laz Diaz type be very, very high. I think it's a really good vetting process. I like how you said a Laz Diaz type when it's literally Laz Diaz. It's Laz Diaz. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was going to go Angel Hernandez type, but then I realized that an Angel Hernandez type is literally just Laz Diaz. Like we have them already. Yeah. Uh, like we, have, we have Angel Hernandez at home. It's Laz Diaz. It's Laz Diaz. Yeah. Question for you. Let's say you call a day game. And you're yeah. watching the ABS system at work. Yeah. When you're calling a triple A game for the Pirates. Then you go home. Let's say we record 7 p.m. You're watching the Major League Pittsburgh Pirates take on the Cubs, for example. Do you prefer the ABS system in the minor leagues? Like, is do you are you ever watching that major league game and thinking to yourself, I wish we had the ABS here? Or do you watch yeah. these major league games and say to yourself, Thank God we don't have the ABS system here? Yeah, that, that's what I do. The latter. Um, I I really hate the full ABS games because it takes human error out of it. And I think human error is so important in baseball. Oh, I think I human error is important in officiating in general. Like PI calls, that creates discussion in the NFL season, in the college football season. You know, like, would it be great if every call was right? Yeah. But like, why pay these umpires? You know what I mean? Like, just just go robot then. I don't love the robot aspect. I think that pitchers learning the umpire, catchers learning the umpire is so important. The other thing, framing is irrelevant in AAA. Irrelevant. It literally does not matter. What if I grabbed a group of 30 young catchers and said, hey, all that framing work that you've done for the last five, 10 years, who cares? Fuck it. It doesn't matter anymore. Do you know how pissed they would be? 
there'd be a lot of jobs lost. And then a lot of guys where they're just going to slot in just basically a DH just to like catch the ball. Yeah. If you, if you are a glorified DH with a hose for an arm, you can catch in triple A might make the games more fun. If it's just like a bunch of Salvi Perez's. I disagree. Pass balls and electric playing baseball. And then he's hitting more homers. I think we lose a large part of the art form with no, AB. I agree. I, I'm, I'm totally kidding there. I, 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 oh, I it's, it's a weird conversation because on one side, you want to get every call right. You want to make the game fair on both sides. You don't want umpires deciding a winner or a loser. And then the other side, you're changing the catching position forever. And there's no human error. There's no, like, I know people sometimes don't like it, but at the end of the day, sports is entertainment. Yes. It is somewhat entertaining. Now, sometimes when you're on the wrong side of it, it sucks in the moment. But to see an umpire and a manager go at it is wildly entertaining. Very. Let's say you don't have a dog in the fight and you're just turning on a game and an umpire makes a bad call and it affects the game and everyone's crazy. Like, that's entertaining. Whether you are on the right side of it or not. And then there are plenty of times where you're the fan and your team gets bailed out by a call. And you're sitting yourself smiling saying under your breath thank god he missed that one yeah like that's fun that is yeah. fun so the more you and arm talking about talk about it watching in the minor leagues every day the more i'm starting to because i was an original robo umps need it especially as a betting person seeing like when i need a team to win and i got yeah ball and you get ball. hosed and it's like yeah, oh, it's this like, was avoidable need the yeah. robo umps now but I do think that it's a better product with the with the humans. We just need better humans. Yeah. We just need better humans. We need the umpires union to not have like dark magic on top of Major League Baseball. And they're treated as if it's a regular job for all 7 billion of the rest of the human population. If you're bad at your job, you get sent down. If you're good at your job, you get promoted. It's not that hard. Yeah. So I think that's what we should do. So now the question for me is, What's the most you would pay for a tender bucket and a judge burger if it meant the Yankees made Juan Soto a Yankee for life? It was asked by Matt Columbia on Twitter. So the reason I wanted to add this is, That's and maybe it's selfish, question. basically, I just wanted to answer it on the podcast. No, it's a great question. My number got very high. And now I'm not a, I'm not a rich person. I'm not. But I was thinking to myself, like I thought about a thousand dollars and I was like, I'd pay more. Thought about two thousand. I'd pay more. Thought about three. The most that I got to was five thousand. And like if it really came down to it, like Brian Cashman calls me up and is like, Peter, we need ten thousand dollars, and I swear to God, I'll make Juan Soto a Yankee for the rest of his life. I think I'd give in and give it to him. I think I would. And like, I'd have to move a lot of stuff around to get $10,000 into Brian Cashman's hands. But after watching, and it was the perfect time to ask this question because I was just in Yankee Stadium watching the Yankees lose to the Dodgers without Juan Soto, thinking to myself, and I made it the TikTok about it too. I bought two of those um, LaBelle steak sandwiches. Like, because I was hungry, but also like, in the back of my stupid brain, I feel like it's contributing. No, it's not. I know. It's not. <laughs> I feel like it is. So hey, how much are the current how much are the current prices of like the tender bucket? The tender bucket, I haven't I haven't I have never had a tender bucket at Yankee Stadium. Oh my god. I never get because I'm not a huge chicken tender fan. How are so, what hold on? Yankee fans hold don't on. come after me. I'm just not a like I don't hold eat on. chicken tenders at the ballpark. I want the burgers. I want the steak sandwiches. I've had sushi there. I've had the hibachi there. Dude, I've had a lot dude. Of, I'm not a tender bucket. I need hibachi at the ballpark. I'm when I go to the I ballpark, need, I can't do chicken I've tenders. I need sushi. I need the nigiri. I need like oh, are you kidding me? I eat hot dogs all the time. I'm just not a chicken tender lover. That's dude, all it is. Said, you just went to, I've had the hibachi at Yankee Stadium, but I I'm can't do the tender all the bucket. foods that I've had at Yankee Stadium. I'm not saying I get hibachi you know what? all the You're time. You're part of the problem. You're part of the problem. No, you I'm are part, part of the Gen I'm Z part. millennial problem. You're the avo toast guy, and you go to the game and you want avo toast. You couldn't live anywhere aside from New York or LA. 
<laughs> That's such bullshit. <laughs> I my normal meal at Yankee Stadium is the LaBelle steak sandwich because I think it's genuinely awesome. Now, is that paying for Soto? I really hope it is. My number two most ordered item at a Yankee game is a hot dog. I'm just saying. It sounds like sushi. It sounds like the sashimi nigiri combo. I'm saying I've had all of those options before having a chicken tender bucket. You're crazy. Why don't you be a normal fucking. When in reality, I'm just trying to pitch into the Juan Soto fund. Bro, it's very easy to demonize a demon. Very easy. What would be question now? I'm, I'm turning it back on you. If you could get a championship from one of your favorite teams, what would it be? From one of my, like, which team? Yes. Like, is it the Bulls? Is it the Bears? It's the Bulls. Is it the, it's, so the Bulls. No, it's the Chicago Bulls, yeah. Okay. How, like, would you pay dollars out of your bank account to have... To retain Zach Levine? No, to get Luca <laughs> on the Bulls. To and get like, Luca Guaranteed winning championships. Like, how much would you pay for that? Because I, in my dumb brain, I think that keeping Juan Soto as a Yankee means that we're going to win multiple championships. Yeah. Whether that's correct or not, that's how I'm internalizing it. And nobody can tell me differently. If you told me, hey, Giannis wants to stay pretty local, but he doesn't want to be a buck anymore. I just need four grand from you. I think I would do it for four that's grand. That's the thing. Like, the number gets higher than it it should be. But like, and I'm saying, okay, if the Bulls GM called, who's the GM of the Bulls right now? AK, man. Arturis Kornishivas. Yeah, he's doing a great job at the hell right no, now. No, he's not. <laughs> We're yeah. stuck. But if he was like, Jack, I need five. Like, I think you'd do it. That's why I kept saying, I, the number kept increasing. Because I, I was, was like, five is my max. But if Brian Cashman asked for six, like, I'm paying for it. I'm doing six. I just don't know if I can physically do $10,000 or more. Dude, like, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not going to chase. And it's like, hey, I, I'm in trouble here. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, the Bulls need Giannis right now. Like, I can't, I can't go there. But I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know what the number is. I, a couple G's, I feel like, to get, to get uh, Giannis in a Bulls uniform, I think I would do it. What's the most amount of money you'd pay for a White Sox World Series? Like, do you even care anymore? Fifteen dollars. <laughs> I I'd, I'd buy a campfire milkshake. <laughs> You're that out, huh? I mean, they won yeah. seventeen games. Yeah. It's June eleventh. <laughs> All right, so that was the mailbag. Hopefully, everybody enjoyed it. And if you did, the best way to support is to rate and review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts five stars and hit that big red subscribe button on YouTube. Turn those alerts on because you get an alert for every video that comes out and hit that big like button. Also get yourself some just baseball merch. You can find it in the episode description. Don't be like Jack. Oh, Oh, look at him. Pull it out. Oh, yeah, just a mic flag. (laughs) You can't buy this, but Oh yeah, never mind. You can't even buy that, but you can buy other things in our merch store, which is in our episode description. Also you need tickets game time. Coaches baseball. You need to bet. Well, you should never need to bet. But if you want to bet, go just baseball on BetMGM. You got to read all the hotline numbers now. (laughs) 1-800-GAMBLER. For Jack McMullen, I'm Peter Opple. We will be back tomorrow. And with that, thank you, everybody.